make that announcement. <laughs> okay, I'm pleased to, uh, to be able to introduce to you Paul Stevens. Uh, I met him for the first time yesterday, but his reputation preceded him. Uh, we've heard a lot about him over the past few months and years, and it's a pleasure to have him uh, back in Japan. He mentioned uh, yesterday it's been about, uh, I guess, over 10 years uh, since he's been back here, although he used to spend quite a bit of time here, and I'll let him mention that uh, in his presentation. But let me give you just a, a bit of background. Uh, Paul is currently the president and CEO of the Investment Company Institute, which is based in the U.S., but also has uh, an arm that is now setting up globally and is called ICI Global, and several of those representatives are here today as well. And if I might take just a moment and introduce also the other ICI representatives here today, Paul, of course, will get uh, plenty of attention in a moment, uh, but Dan Waters, sitting at the lead table, is the head of ICI Global. We have uh, Anya Driggs, uh, she works in the legal department, special, specializing in pensions. And we have Shumei Yang, who's the head of the uh, Asia Pacific operations for the, the group and based in Hong Kong. So it's a pleasure to have you here and I hope you have a chance to interact with them as well. So back to Paul. Uh, Paul, early in his career, uh, spent a stint as a special assistant for the national security affairs to President Ronald Reagan. So automatically bolting him to, uh, to pretty important positions and higher level issues. Uh, he is a U.S. attorney and practiced uh, most recently with uh, the firm Deckert LLP. Uh, he's been president and CEO of the ICI since 2004. So as a CEO, being in the same position for 11 years, that's quite an accomplishment for any CEO. So congratulations for that one. He's also currently the chair of the International Investment Funds Association, which is essentially the international version of uh, the funds associations that uh, the various funds associations get together. And he's the current chair of that group. Um, as head of ICI, he's overseen the setup of ICI Global, as I mentioned. They continue to expand their reach around the world. As the chairman, uh, or co-chair rather, of the Investment Management uh, Committee, uh, I'm pleased to continue our associations with them. They actually call into our meetings every month and offer us insights into what's going on uh, in the U.S. and around the world and help keep us uh, clued in. As you know, we, uh, we may have a tendency here in Japan to become uh, somewhat uh, Galapagos-esque and uh, the ICI helps us uh, avoid that. They've been terrific, they're a great research organization, uh, very well known and uh, knowledgeable, and I think a lot of that comes from the great leadership at the top and the great team that uh, uh, Paul has assembled there. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Paul Stevens. Uh, Doug, thank you very much for a, a very generous introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you, um, and I say that most sincerely. Um, it has been since, I think, 1999 that I've been back here in, uh, in Tokyo, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be back as I fumble with my speech. Um, and the reason um, that it's such a pleasure is that in the, sort of in the middle or the early middle of my career, following time in government service at the White House and the Pentagon that Doug referred to, I was chosen by the Japan Society as a U.S.-Japan Leadership Fellow. And I was resident for several months in Tokyo in 1990. I was living at the International House of Japan over in Roppongi and wor working out of the Research Institute for Peace and Security. As you may recall, um, this was at the time of the first Gulf crisis following Iraq's invasion of Kuwait when Japan was wrestling with the role of its armed forces in international peace cooperation. I had the opportunity not only to get, this, get to know this uh, great city of Tokyo, but also to travel through much of, the, of Japan. And um, I really cherish those memories as I do the Japanese friends that I made in those days. And I'm glad of the many subsequent opportunities I've had to visit here. My fingers have no tackiness to them, I'm afraid. Um, Looking back, I could not have predicted that I would be returning 25 years later to Tokyo once again as head of the Investment Company Institute. So for those of you who don't know ICI, we're a leading global trade association for funds that are closely regulated and are offered to the public and jurisdictions worldwide. We seek to encourage adherence to high ethical standards in the fund business. We seek to promote public understanding of funds and fund investing. We also seek otherwise to advance the interests of funds, their shareholders, their directors, and their advisors. You know, because of the many advantages that they offer to investors, 
Funds have emerged as key financial intermediaries in countries literally all around the world. And it's from that perspective today that I want to discuss the state of our capital markets. My remarks will focus on why so many countries, with Japan at the foremost, are working to develop and strengthen their capital markets. I want to discuss the three important advantages that strong capital markets offer to economies, namely efficiency, stability, and flexibility. And that discussion, in turn, will lead us into possible regulatory developments that could compromise the role of capital markets in building more robust economies. As it happens, this year marks the 75th anniversary of the modern fund industry in the United States and also the 75th birthday of ICI. Since 1940, mutual funds and other regulated funds have operated and prospered in the United States under a comprehensive framework of laws and regulations established by the last of the so-called New Deal legislation. The history of the last 75 years is a remarkable story of orderly growth and evolution. Our U.S. funds have, over time, become the primary vehicle for Americans who want to participate in stock and bond markets. In fact, today, more than 90 million Americans own shares in mutual funds. These investors enjoy a wealth of choices and strategies in a highly competitive landscape, some 800 U.S. fund sponsors offering more than 16,000 funds. As a result, and think about this for a moment, the assets managed by U.S. regulated funds have grown from $1.1 billion in 1940 to almost $18 trillion today, and that's an increase of 1.6 million percent. Now, that's a record we take pride in, and many factors have contributed to the growth of U.S. mutual funds and to the democratization of investing that they represent. But surely one critical factor reflects a key strength of the American financial system, its robust capital markets. Now, as Doug said, ICI today is a global organization. In the past three and a half years, we've opened offices in London and Hong Kong and have gained new fund members from four continents, including here in Japan. We're pursuing a global policy agenda that includes promotion of capital markets and increased use of regulated funds and retirement systems in jurisdictions around the world. And one common theme that I hear in country after country is this. How can we here develop stronger capital markets? How can we allocate capital more efficiently to promote economic growth, diversify our sources of financing, move money out of bank deposits and into equity, encourage savers to become investors and to take reasonable risks for better returns? improve our population's prospects for retirement security, and foster a culture that encourages entrepreneurship and ownership. As leaders around the world seek to revive or strengthen their economies, they recognize that their financial systems must include robust alternatives to banks as a source of funding. Now, here in Japan, the government has created the Panel for Vitalizing Financial and Capital Markets to help strengthen the economy. An explicit goal is to develop, quote, a society where individuals build wealth with risk allocation appropriate to the stage of their life cycle. To advance that end, the panel aims to foster the development of asset management and investment funds. In Europe, the latest theme is the development of a capital markets union, or CMU to, quote, further develop and integrate capital markets to help reduce Europe's very high dependence on bank funding and to increase the attractiveness of Europe as a place to invest. The European Commission views development of the CMU as a key part of its jobs and growth agenda. In Latin America and Southeast Asian nations, in China, India, and Brazil, governments are pursuing policies to develop stock exchanges, enhance market-based debt financing, and encourage new investment. Even in sub-Saharan Africa, 16 new stock exchanges have opened in the last quarter century. Why? Why are leaders from so wide a range of countries placing so much emphasis on diversifying their financial systems? 
why do they want to supplement deposit-based banking with investment and ownership through equity and fixed income markets? Now, economists and policymakers who have studied these questions have identified many advantages gained through developed capital markets. I will concentrate on three, efficiency, economic stability, and economic flexibility. So to begin, for many purposes, capital markets are more efficient than banks in matching savers, the providers of capital, with borrowers, the enterprises or households that need funding. As technology has improved, the information advantages that banks rely upon to underwrite borrowers have eroded. So borrowers have found it costs less to eliminate or minimize the role of the middleman by raising funds more directly with stock investors or bond buyers. Capital markets also help distribute risk more efficiently. Each issuer of stock or bonds presents a unique set of risks based on its products, its business strategy, and its financing model. Each investor gets to decide which of those risks it is best able to assume because an investor is more or less tolerant of risk, or because it holds other assets with offsetting risks. You can see this through a personal example. Younger savers tend to invest, all younger savers should tend to invest, more heavily in stocks than older savers, because younger people have a longer time horizon and more working years to recover from any downturn in the market. Investors can voluntarily assume the risk that best fits their circumstances, and that helps create a more efficient financial system. Developed capital markets also help enhance economic stability. Now think about it for a moment. Securities that trade in markets offer immediate feedback. Frequent trading provides a readily updated scorecard on the value of assets. Every trade is a reflection of the myriad economic factors that can affect the value or creditworthiness of a company or a country. Unlike bank lenders, owners of stocks and bonds can't carry their assets on their books for months or years without reflecting these ch changing values. Now, that might seem to make capital markets more volatile, and some policymakers sometimes dislike markets for exactly that reason. But in a landmark 2004 study of the financial markets, Glenn Hubbard, who is the dean of the Columbia University Graduate School of Business, and Bill Dudley, then the chief U.S. economist of Goldman Sachs, argued that this mark-to-market approach enhances economic stability. Capital markets make it more difficult to avoid recognizing economic or financial problems, they wrote. Thus, quote, as a result, pain is born in real time. They contrast that to the regulatory forbearance that troubled banks all too often receive. Regulators look the other way and allow problems to grow. Usually, they write, this forbearance just creates a much bigger problem that poses a greater threat to macroeconomic stability. Now, there are many examples of this pattern at work, including the savings and loan debacle in my country, and I would submit Japan's decade-long banking crisis. Even without a crisis, the frequent feedback from capital markets rewards good policies and punishes bad decisions. All else being equal, when tax, spending, and regulatory policies are harmonized for economic growth, asset prices rise, investors are happier, and policymakers are rewarded. Thus, developed capital markets support economic stability. The third factor is economic flexibility. Put simply, capital markets encourage entrepreneurship. As Ross Levine, an economist at the University of California, Berkeley said, quote, one way to define a better financial system is that it does a superior job allocating capital to those with the best projects, ideas, and entrepreneurial energy. Risk-tolerant equity investors are better equipped than risk-averse banks to finance groundbreaking ideas. Robust capital markets can finance new companies earlier in their development, speeding their growth. 
Now, authorities in Europe recently have recognized this potential benefit from deeper capital markets. In a speech last month, Jonathan Hill, the member of the European Commission responsible for financial services, noted that if European venture capital markets were on the same scale as those markets in America, quote, companies would have been able to tap into an extra 90 billion euros of funding between 2008 and 2013, funding more than an estimated 4,000 venture capital deals. Imagine the new ideas, even the new industries that might have grown. Greater efficiency, economic stability, economic flexibility. Those are the advantages that come from developing better capital markets, and as I have noted, they are widely recognized. The next question is how? How can policymakers foster changes in systems and in culture to encourage investment? Now, jurisdictions with highly successful capital markets share a number of common elements. Let me mention a few. First, a sound legal system with strong property rights is essential. Corporate governance, in particular, must be oriented toward protecting and appropriately rewarding investors, the owners of companies and the takers of risks, rather than the interests of corporate managers. Similarly, government must not try to pick winners and losers. That is, they must avoid tax or credit policies that favor certain interests and thus distort investment decisions. Capital markets allow investors to send their cash to the ideas and businesses where it can be used most effectively. Governments seeking economic efficiency need to respect that process. Now, sound regulation is also crucial. Exchanges and clearing and settlement systems must be organized and supervised to help markets run efficiently and to provide liquidity for trading. Issuers of stocks and bonds must be subject to well-accepted accounting rules and high standards for reporting and transparency. Regulators, too, must follow transparent procedures. Markets can thrive under a wide range of rules, but they do not do well when no one knows what the rules are. Capital markets regulation also works best when it is based more on principles and less on prescriptions. Financial market participants tend to have great skill in finding and exploiting gaps in a prescriptive system. Broader principles aimed at managing risks and conflicts tend to work more effectively. In that regard, there is one key principle that has served the mutual fund industry well, the principle of fiduciary duty that an asset manager owes to the funds and investors that it serves. Now, essentially, a fiduciary is one who takes it upon himself or herself to act for or advise another, thus inviting the other's trust and confidence. The distinguishing obligations of, of a fiduciary are the twin duties of loyalty and care. For a fund advisor, loyalty to the interests of fund shareholders and due care in managing their assets are essential. Investors must trust that their advisor is looking out for them. Strong laws, fair tax and credit policies, and sound principle-based regulation, these are among the key ingredients for strong capital markets. Now, as an aside, let me just say, based on my limited knowledge of the government of Japan's program for vitalizing capital markets, it appears to me that Japan is moving in the right direction on these and other measures. I hesitate to comment in depth because I'm no expert here, but all that I knew before I came and much that I've learned since arriving here in Japan this week make me believe the effort is going ahead and the panel is making good progress. But as I've said, governments from Addis Ababa to Singapore are trying to nurture stronger capital markets because they want the benefits of efficiency, economic stability, and economic flexibility that such markets can bring. Yet, in the wake of the financial crisis, we are seeing a concerted movement by banking regulators to assert unprecedented authority over asset managers and thus over the capital markets in which they participate. This is evident in the work of two councils of regulators that were recently created to guard against, quote, systemic risk, financial institutions or financial activities that could trigger or accelerate 
the next great financial crisis. These councils, the Multinational Financial Stability Board in Basel, Switzerland, and in the U.S., the Financial Stability Oversight Council, are pursuing the notion that funds and asset managers are merely, quote, shadow banks, that they pose supersized threats to financial stability, and that they should be subject to bank-style regulation. Now, what would that mean exactly? Likely, it would mean capital requirements that have never been applied to funds and do not fit the business model of funds. It also would mean a regime of enhanced prudential supervision designed around protecting the banking system, not serving the interests of investors. And this conflicted model of regulation could reach far into the mutual fund business. Under the latest proposal by the Financial Stability Board, more than half, now let me repeat that, more than half of the assets that Americans hold in mutual funds, almost $10 trillion, could be swept into this new framework of Fed regulation. Now, this would be ironic if it were not so worrisome. After all, the financial crisis was first and foremost a banking problem, fueled by the collapse of major banking institutions. Banking regulators failed to anticipate the risks from the U.S. housing market and subprime mortgages that banks had issued and sold. The carnage in the banking system did create problems for U.S. money market funds, but those issues have been addressed through two sets of reforms already passed by the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States. But other types of regulated funds, stock and bond funds, came through the crisis without incident. In fact, I would submit that America's regulated stock and bond funds proved to be among the most stable parts of the global financial system during the 2008-2009 crisis. Indeed, former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan has suggested that the financial crisis would have caused much less damage if the U.S. financial system had relied more on capital markets, on mutual funds in particular. Writing after the crisis, Greenspan noted that subprime mortgages were the, quote, toxic asset of the financial crisis. But if these mortgages had been held by mutual funds, he wrote, quote, we would not have seen the serial contagion that we did. Chairman Greenspan recognized that the impact of losses at banks are concentrated and multiplied by the leverage that banks use to swell their balance sheets. But mutual funds, certainly in the United States, use little or no leverage, and fund shareholders accept the fact that they will share any gains or any losses on the assets that their funds hold. ICI and its members have amassed a weighty record of data and analysis on the question of funds and systemic risk. This is a record that draws on 75 years of experience with stock and bond funds through one market crisis after another. The conclusion, at least for us, is very clear. There is no basis for the proposition that regulated stock or bond funds or their managers pose outsized risks to the financial system. Moreover, regulating funds like banks would be extremely harmful. It would penalize investors, distort the fund marketplace, and compromise regulated funds' important role in financing a growing economy. Indeed, if central bankers impose highly prescriptive regulations on funds and their managers, they will run a significant risk of diminishing the diversification in financial services that capital markets provide. Their actions, ironically, could exacerbate volatility in markets, increase the probability of shocks to the financial system, and make those shocks more harmful, not less. Now, I am not saying that our funds or capital market participants generally are opposed to regulation. Remember, earlier I said that, quote, sound regulation is crucial to the development and operation of robust capital markets. Mutual funds, in particular, have prospered under a comprehensive and effective framework of regulation that has withstood the test of time, 75 years' worth. But the advantages that capital markets bring in promoting efficiency, economic stability, and economic flexibility rest in the fact that funds and other capital markets participants are not banks and are not regulated like banks. Undermining that financial diversity by imposing bank-style regulation on capital market participants will not serve our economies well. 
When I came to Japan 25 years ago, I was at something of a crossroads in my career. For five years, I had been deeply engaged in issues of foreign policy and defense at senior levels of the United States government. After my experience in Japan, I had various opportunities to continue to work in that field. I decided, however, to return to my previous path and the practice of law, becoming over time more and more involved with financial services regulation as counsel to mutual funds, their boards, and their advisors. I'm sometimes asked if I miss the grand issues on which I worked while on the staff of the National Security Council. In some ways, I do. And I certainly have maintained a keen interest in such matters to this day, including an interest in U.S.-Japan security relations. But I've never felt that matters of finance, particularly on the scale that we're discussing today, should be regarded as secondary. As the historian Neil Ferguson has written, quote, the evolution of credit and debt was as important as any technological innovation in the rise of civilization. Without the foundation of borrowing and lending, the economic history of our world would scarcely have gotten off the ground. Today, the health of our economies depend no less on the strength of our financial systems and the role that capital markets, and I would submit investment companies, regulated funds can play. That is why it is so vital for us, all of us, to pay close attention to the issues that I've covered here today and make sure that our policymakers in Washington, Tokyo, and elsewhere get them right. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Okay, test. Thank you, Paul. Um, very insightful, and uh, being a member of the uh, fund industry, I'm quite, uh, quite interested in everything you said there. Um, it's now time for Q&A. I have plenty of questions from my side, but I'm going to defer to the audience uh, and I'll let you go first. They're stupefied. Anything? <laughs> okay, there we go. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your remarks. Uh, my name is Ed Rogers, and my uh, initial question is this: So you, you specifically define the, the the fund industry as mutual fund industry. I'm curious to know your views on where the alternative space, hedge funds, private equity funds, uh, and the like, fit into your view on you know again the regulatory kind of threat, if you will, uh, and the kind of handcuffing effect. Of, of regulations going forward, or does, is, that, is that not part of the world that the ICI looks at? It, it's not part of the world that we represent, both in the United States and globally. Our members consist of highly regulated funds that are publicly offered. Um, most, I, most hedge fund people would say they're pretty highly regulated these days, and so would private well, equity guys. And, and maybe publicly offered too, but that's not the case in the <laughs> United States. It, it, in any event, my, my, point is that my point would be twofold. Hedge funds, private funds generally serve an extraordinarily important role in the capital markets. So much of what I've said about the capital markets and robust capital markets apply to them equally as well. With respect to uh, um, the issue of systemic importance and designation as CIFIs, uh, the work of the Financial Stability Board and to some extent the FSOC have focused, at least uh, it seems to us, much more intently on asset managers and funds based upon their sheer size. And in the highly regulated fund space of registered investment companies in the United States, our funds grow much larger than hedge funds do. Um, but there's a very big difference between them. If you look at the top 10 uh, stock and bond funds in the United States by assets, they have about 0.4 leverage. Sure. Uh, and they've got to cover the borrowings in order to make sure that at the end of the day, they never lose any more money than they have. While my understanding is that the hedge fund community has pulled down its leverage component since the crisis, it's still many multiples of that 0.4. Sure. So the risk profiles across the asset management business are different as well, and those are ones that have to be taken into account by the regulators in an appropriate fashion. Thank you. Hi, Paul. Ernie Olson from OCC. Um, I'm curious uh, what your perspectives might be on three or four things that you, from an, from an outsider's perspective, think the Japanese market would benefit from or regulators would uh, be advised to do. 
Well, um, so I, I tried to inform myself about this debate because I think it's a very important one he, here in Japan, and it's an important one for the future of the asset management and the investment fund industry in Japan. Uh, one place I would say I think is very good to start with is a focus on return on equity to investors. Uh, people in, take uh, their capital and risk it as equity investors for a reason, because they're expecting some return. And um, uh, my sense is in the United States there's a big debate, have we emphasized return to shareholders too much? It's also uh, possible to emphasize it too little. And structural issues here in Japan, particularly cross ownership and the, and the like, uh, perhaps have made the underlying equity investor uh, less a center of management's attention than it should be. But certainly in an era where uh, Japan is trying to get more equity capital, risk capital to work, focus on ROE to the underlying investors is a very good thing. Um, I would say uh, in the United States we've had an evolution over time in the distribution of funds so that transactional compensation, commissions, loads, that sort of thing have become much, much less significant over time in the United States. And the distribution model is now much more fee-based. And I think uh, while that doesn't necessarily mean that people are paying less um, to access funds, it does mean that um, the interests of the underlying investor and the uh, intermediary can be um, um, uh, aligned more carefully. Uh, if uh, you're depending simply upon tra transactional compensation, your incentives are for more transactions. If it's fee-based compensation, then what your focus should be is on growing your investor's or client's account. And if the su investor succeeds and you have an asset-based fee, you will succeed as well. So that's been an important aspect uh, of, of, of the uh, US market experience that may have relevance here. Um, Another is open architecture, and, and for many uh, fund jurisdictions, this is a hard thing to achieve. Um, I uh, spent two years at Charles Schwab. I was the uh, lawyer for the Schwab Fund supermarket. That was a, a category killer, in a sense, because you could go to Schwab and get mutual funds sponsored by virtually everyone. But over time, I think, there has been an understanding that whether it's a wrap fee program or a shelf of mutual funds that you're trying to create and make available to clients, that the rewards are to make the best in breed available, not necessarily the proprietary product that on a short-term basis is going to give you the greatest reward at, at, a, at a corporate level. So focusing on best in breed and what is going to return the client's interest, I think, has been a winning strategy in the United States. And I would, I would commend it to, to other jurisdictions as well. I think there's also been a huge focus in the United States in investing, investor education around the cost of fund investing and how it detracts from your long-term returns. And our regulators certainly have had a strong focus on transparency and cost disclosures. If you look at a summary prospectus in the United States, before you get to the performance of the fund, right up front, it's what, what you're gonna pay in fees and expenses to be an investor of the fund. So those are some thoughts. Sorry, if there's no one else, I'll, I'll ask you. Just curious, 10 years from now, where do you see the mutual fund industry vis-a-vis -vis the ETF industry? Who's going to be bigger? Who's getting bigger? Who's going to be smaller? Yeah. Um, ETFs are part of our membership as well. Um, uh, ETFs in the United States are a form of open-end investment company uh, that uh, simply happens to trade throughout the day in a secondary market. So when people ask me, do you like mutual funds or ETFs, my answer is always yes. Um, uh, there's been a spectacular rise of ETFs in the United States. Uh, they now have, uh, I think, some two plus trillion dollars in ETFs invested in the US. That's up from maybe 150 billion 11 years ago. So it's been quite a ride. Um, but remember, I said the, the total fund industry in the United States is 18 trillion dollars. So that's a spectacular rise off of a, of a fairly small base in percentage terms. Um, virtually all of our ETFs are index products. Um, there is no active, truly active, undisclosed management form uh, uh, in the ETF sector in the US. 
Um, but it's obviously proven tremendously valuable for our investors. Uh, and I think is a representative of yet another innovation, one of many over the years in our, in our fund market that has been valuable. And I'll give you one example. Um, in the U.S. and not so much here in Japan, we have um, uh, registered investment advisors who essentially serve as, as uh, investment counselors to individual clients. And many of them turn to ETFs as highly efficient, low-cost vehicles to provide exposure to their clients to a whole range of different asset classes. And so it's proven to be a very, very good tool in different parts of the market. We have participants now um, who are trying to bring ETF investing to retirement plans. So I think ETFs have a, a unless the regulators screw it up somehow, um, have a very, very um, bright future and just represent yet another uh, in a series of important innovations that have created the dynamic and highly successful fund market that we enjoy in the States. Yes, hello, Hamish Ross, Fusion Systems. Um, I know it's rather probably outside your, your gambit to talk about supranational um, lending institutions, but the, the recent controversy surrounding the uh, Chinese-sponsored uh, AIIB and um, the fact that uh, multi uh, national um, capital provision is now not solely the, dom the dominance of uh, the US model versus uh, a lot of other countries now have, have deep pools of surplus capital. Can you share any thoughts with us on on uh, how you view sort of global regulation of the industry uh, might affect the, the fund industry? I'm, I'm not sure that it will have any, any uh, impact on the, the fund industry that I'm describing here today. And, just to be clear, my organization, our membership, has no official position on this, but I can give you a personal observation. Um, I, I think it was um, uh, a, um, a mistake for the United States to oppose, and certainly oppose so publicly, uh, this new institution. In fact, I think probably the United States should have joined it. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is something that is, it seems to me, natural for China and others to try to pull together and to create uh, um, so I, 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 I sort of think that Washington made way too much of this, um, uh, and it was a policy mistake. Um, we'll see. There are a lot of issues, the devil's in the details that go, as it goes forward, and what, really what its policies are for, what the, the new lending facility is going to be used for, whose purposes it serves, right? That's, that's a debate that participants, uh, and including China, will have to sort of figure out as they go along. Um, but. Uh, this is something I, I believe the Obama administration uh, was wrong to have uh, have opposed. Please, in the back. Thank you. Uh, this is Kawabata from Mori Building. So this is my first time to join these meetings. So um, my question is, so in Japan, uh, there are so many uh, regulatory government body is the impact into the uh, global fund. Let's say, for example, if you invest to the commodities, the Ministry of Agriculture and know, AGFF is controlling. And if you invest to the uh, commodities metals, the METI is handling that. And if you invest to the uh, real estate, the MLIT, Kokodo uh, Kotsu will handle that. And then the financial service agency is actually control the financial institution in Japan. In such a way, if you diversify the investment items or investment targets, so you have to ask for them uh, what, what, what kind of investment you can do. So let's say, for example, the MAN investment uh, takes their office out of Japan. So they went out from Japan, Japanese market. So because of they cannot adopt to the Japanese reporting systems. So what do you think about these issues? So I'm really interested in the venture capital and the private equity investment in Japan to be grown. But the, the, there are two bodies controlling, METI and financial service agency is controlling the venture capital business. So this is a kind of a, a conflict in Japan. So what do you think about this situation? I'm not sure I'm competent to comment on um, uh, venture capital and private equity here in Japan. Um, our focus is, is on the, is on the uh, the, the investment fund, investment trust area. Um, 
But, but I, I do take your point. I, I must tell you that Japan is not alone in having a vast bureaucracy. Our, uh, our financial um, uh, institutions in the United States are governed by at least as dazzling array of uh, cabinet departments and agencies as yours. Um, it, it's not a competition we ought to seek to promote, uh, however. Um, and the, the one, the one um, early promise that the Obama administration in the United States had made when we began on the debate over Dodd-Frank is that at the end of it we would have fewer regulatory agencies rather than more. Well, you know what happened. We have actually many more than we started with. So that seems inexorably to be the, the trend. I don't see any other hands at this point, so I'll, I'll throw one in there. Um, in your speech, you talked a little bit about uh, regulations and the need for transparency. I'm just curious to know what you've seen over the past 10 or so years, 10 plus years you've been in your position. Um, the, the ability for the industry to encourage more transparency, um, how has that impacted the industry and helped? It's a great Take question. A it's a great question, Doug. And, and the, the, the answer to me is a little, it took some learning, but it's a little counterintuitive. Um, what, we, what we emphasized in the dialogue with our regulators, and we, we continue to do that, is that you can create materials, remembering that ours is mostly a retail industry, you can create materials that help ordinary investors magnificently, uh, ones that uh, focus them on the right questions, provide them the right information in an accessible form, and provide that to them without any loss of all of the very, very rich detail that someone who is an institution or a very driven individual might wish, and that that can be available in real time on the internet. So we, we've been encouraging the utilization of technology for these purposes. That don't, not only reduces costs, it saves some forests in the process, um, um, but it, it, uh, it, it, it helps to emphasize for individuals the information that they ought to be focused on most importantly. That's a principle, I think, that's been operative in some other jurisdictions as well. It's not gone as far in the United States as I think it should. Uh, we still have uh, uh, annual and semi-annual reports to our shareholders which are quite voluminous and would benefit from the same thing that our prospectuses did with the development of the summary prospectus. There's one other thing I would mention, and that's thinking about the younger generation of investors, something that Japan needs to think about, something that we need to think about in the United States. Um, these are uh, young people who are so, so conversant with technologies. And in, it, certainly in the United States, and perhaps here as well, there are regulatory impediments to really fully utilizing technological solutions to inform, to educate, um, to facilitate their role in, in investing and building their own financial future. We've got to figure out a better model in the United States and elsewhere to, to do that. Point. Very good point. Please, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah Hayden from Edelman. Um, whilst I think we can totally understand the, the, the kind of fear of overregulation, um, at the same time, um, what is the Institute's view on ensuring there's enough regulation to actually protect um, investors? For example, no more Madoffs, no more crazy scandals that we've had in Japan that have pushed the trust of the asset management industry down so low. Be interested in your views on that. Mm. Well, um, I'm not sure that any regulatory system is going to be scandal proof. Uh, um, and um, obviously made off and others spectacular failures and oversight. Um, I'm not sure that they were spectacular failures of regulation, however. Um, obviously what, what made off and others were doing uh, was prohibited by a wide variety of existing statutes and regulations. Um, the, the real issue is how you oversee and enforce those regulations, and I think um, that's, that has been the problem, not a, not a failure of, of, of standards. And that's a challenge in a very complex economic life that all of our jurisdictions have, and we just need to reapply ourselves to do as good a job as possible. I will say that, that um, um, uh, in the mutual fund industry in the United States, through the ICI, um, we spend an enormous amount of our time with members um, assisting them in compliance, understanding new regulations, trying to communicate a, at, at, the, at the highest level a kind of culture of fund investing, which is shareholder friendly, shareholder centric, uh, out of the conviction that our managers are only going to really succeed if the shareholders are succeeding as well. 
And so uh, our focus as an association, I said, is maintaining high ethical standards. That really is part of it. And all of us who are involved in associations, and the, the, your committee, the ACCJ, many others, um, need to communicate those expectations and those standards as widely as possible. Um, so it's a, it's a big job and it never ends. I think we're okay, Dan. Give us a few more minutes. It's just quarter after. I'll take another question. And then, please. Actually, can we take two, maybe? <laughs> yes. Okay, Ed, and then uh, in the corner. You, you, you touched on something that I think is a, a fascinating uh, topic of conversation. I think you, you probably interact with a lot of regulators. Um, and I'm really curious to know if uh, the Dodd-Frank legislation in particular, there are feelings of chagrin or regret at any level uh, at the extent to which that now inhibits the process of retained earnings going into risk or funding of risk ventures. So you, you started out your remark saying this is sort of the point of the whole fund industry is how we take savings and we convert it into uh, a useful form or a, a risk appropriate form mm -hmm. of financing of new ventures. And I, I completely agree with that that thought. And you know, you, you, you could say the Glass Steagall worked for a long time until they got rid of it and that and that is the source perhaps of the global financial crisis as much as anything else, this this combining of the utility capital from commercial banks with the leveraging function of investment banks. Right. Anyway, not, not to drone on, but do you think that at some point there's gonna be a view amongst the legislators who, who do run this and who are running Dodd-Frank down to the detail level that the inhi inhibition, the, 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 the restraints they're putting on uh, the movement of retained earnings into risk capital has gone too far? That's the, the basic question. You know, in the, in the banking system, I'm not sure I'm, I'm competent to answer that. I would say that there are voices in the Congress now who want to return to Glass-Steagall. They want to turn the clock way back um, um, where there was the post-depression, um, uh, 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 if you will, solution, which was completely divorce securities from banking. Um, I don't know if there is a, a sound case to be made for that or not, but if there is, it, it doesn't lie in the part of the marketplace that we concern ourselves with. Um, um, sponsoring, uh, managing registered funds in the United States, and I think elsewhere, has not proved to be a risky venture for banks. Uh, for exactly the same reason that outside of banks, funds do not present a high risk profile. Um, it's an agency business, it's not a leverage business. The, the, the gains and the losses that are prospectively there belong entirely to the customer. They're highly regulated business, a highly transparent business. So I would say whatever the merits of that might be, um, they're not in this part of the, of the asset management world. Well, you, you may, you, yeah. You may take it for my comments that I'm resisting being sucked into it. <laughs> <laughs> Diplomatically put. Okay, one last question from the corner, please. Leanne Poon from NWorld. Thank you for your comments. Regarding management fees, do you foresee them coming down in the future, especially with the ETS becoming bigger? And if another financial crisis were to hit us, if value is going to be eroded again. So are people going to be paying that much again, 3 4% for active management? What do you think? Well, you know, um, each year we calculate what the, what the overall fees and expenses are on a dollar-weighted basis that fund investors in the United States incur. And for 25 years, they have continued down. They have continued down for stock funds. They've continued down for fixed income funds. They've continued down at, at a slightly gentler slope for money market funds. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how long that trend can continue, but I do not see it reversing. Um, one of the m aspects of the U.S. fund model is that it's highly price inflexible. In order to raise the cost for fund investors, you not only have to have the independent directors on their boards approve that, but you have to change the contract and go out to shareholders and have them approve that. Um, um, so in, in our market, at least, that trend is very, very distinct, and it's actually um, amplified by the fact that so many funds are in retirement accounts. Because there you have the employer choosing the lineup of the funds, and employers know very well that cost is an important consideration 
uh, as they select the funds that their employees will be relying upon for retirement investing. So in the retirement space, we even see a much more significant downward pressure. In fact, I would say that in the U.S. 401ks, you have the least expensive funds on the planet available to investors. That's also a benefit of, of that structure. And part of it is scale. And part of it is very long-term sticky assets that advisors uh, uh, at funds uh, find very attractive as a, as a target for, for long-term management. So thank you for your question. Thank you all very much. Okay, thank you.